G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, Get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. Yeah, so, Dad, what's going on? Welcome to this episode of The Goss. Hey, Pete. Yeah, good. Um, skin cancer city at the moment. Well, potential skin cancer city. I um, Dad's been under the knife. I have been under the knife and I've been under the liquid nitrogen. So, uh, yeah, last week I had four little spots burnt off with liquid nitrogen that were, you know, becoming irritating. Um, and then you know, got the, you know, the, the annual sort of, you know, my birthday's the end of September. So, September, October are usually these sort of annual health checkups. Um, and so, doctor, this time we decided that we'd go through the um, yeah, the prostate cancer one. So, firstly, go and get your prostate levels checked. Um, mine had gone up from two years ago to last year. Uh, this is just a blood test for uh, an indicator for um, prostate cancer. So, you didn't get the uh, uh, pleasurable experience of having a stranger's thumb up your ass. No, no, <laughs> not this time. I had that in the past and everything was okay. But, um, but yeah, last year my PSA level went up. And so, yeah, doctor said, well, we'll check it again after six months. So, yeah. checked it and it had gone down again. So, okay. yay, good news. Uh, but so then we decided. Well, if we're going to do that, we might as well do the uh, yeah, the the full body check for uh, for skin cancers, having burnt a few off. How long does and that were, take? That must oh, take ages. Look, yeah, it was it was just yeah anything that was obvious. Yeah, it wasn't yeah you know, stripped down and yeah you know, we'll do uh, okay. everything. Um, but it was it was more because um, I got lots of yeah you know, spots and bits and pieces. Dad's yeah, got freckles. My, yeah, so. my yeah my Scottish suntan, like all the join the dots suntan. Um, yeah, you know, the longer you stay out in the sun, the you know the more you've got. Um, and so there are a few that I was concerned about, and yeah, you know, obviously I've got spots on my back, and I don't yeah. get to see those. So, uh, and he found one on my back, and I had one on my chest, and one on my shoulder, and there was another one on my other, the other part of the shoulder. So we carved all those off yesterday. So I'm sitting here at the moment with various patches, and no, I can't pull that up because you won't be able to see it. But yeah, um, yeah with you know, you know, just taking a small scraping and getting them biopsied. So it may turn out that none of them is skin cancer, but yeah. you know, more than one might be. And I've certainly had a few taken off in the past. And this is one of these challenges of, um, I think I joked with you yesterday, um, you know, text messaging that mm-hmm. um, you know, growing up in the 60s with a mother whose version of SunSafe was uh, make sure you've got a suntan before Christmas. So. Well, yeah, I wonder if that does make sense to some degree if you get the suntan during winter, although maybe it's difficult to get. You can't. That's the point. Because the, um, the UV but it was is as a soon as, lower. Yeah, as soon as you know, spring came out that, yeah, it was, you know, it was always mum would be out sunbaking in October, November <laughs> because she thought that if you've got a suntan, you can't get sunburned. Well, you probably the, won't you're get You're missing the point that, that a suntan yeah. is sunburned. <laughs> well, or that, yeah, the, the getting the tan in the process of getting the tan is actually exposing you to eventually having skin cancer as much. As much as getting sunburned or not. As much right? as getting badly sunburned. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, mind you, I have had the uh, you know, gagged about 
um, you know, when I had first had a couple of skin cancers cut off and the doctor said, oh, yeah, you really need to you know, be wearing shirts and hats and sunscreen and everything else. And I said, well, I do all that now, but let's be frank. <laughs> if I if I get if I go outside now and, and get, you know, skin cancer somewhere, you know, get a mutation in my cells because of exposure, exposure to the sun now, yeah. I'm not going to die of that. That'll <laughs> I'm going to die of plenty years. other things yeah. that have happened to me in the past. Oh, that's it. If you, uh, if you, yeah, it is crazy. I wonder why it takes so long. I would like to know more about skin cancer and why it takes so long for that mu- mutation to propagate and turn into cancer. Like if it's there and it's just sitting there waiting for that, you yeah. know, decades well, I think and there decades. Are- yeah, there are, you know, um, without giving a, as a non-expert, a lesson on skin cancer, um, there's a whole variety of different sorts of skin cancer and some of them will be there for decades. Um, yeah. But their replication rate is so low that, you know, you're never, it's never going to be a problem. And the type of cancer that they are means that they don't metastasize. In other words, they don't go out to other parts of your body. Um, but then there are some that do and some that grow much more quickly. And obviously melanoma being the obvious, you know, the the obvious one of those that it grows quickly and it'll metastasize quickly. So if you find something, then you get rid of it as quickly as you can. So that's what we've been doing um, for the last day. So I'm now sitting around and because I've got stitches in various places and the um, doctor said, oh, just you know, don't do anything strenuous and don't stretch. <laughs> don't to, do any star uh, jumps. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's not much that you can do um, that doesn't stretch your back or your chest or your shoulders. So, uh, fortunately, I can sit here and talk to you without doing too much. Yeah, far out. Was this something that people were aware, aware of back in your day when you were younger? No. At least, whether or not 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 necessarily aware of the fact that exposing themselves to the sun at a young age would would give them a higher chance of getting skin cancer at a later age, but were they aware of cancer as much as they are today? Oh, people were aware of cancer generically because, you know, obviously people were still getting, you know, lung cancer. In fact, lung cancer was you know, much more prevalent um, when I was a child and a teenager than it is now because far fewer people smoke um, and have done for decades. So, you know, the, the number of people getting smoking-related lung cancer has decreased because mm-hmm. the number of people smoking has decreased. But, you know, both my parents died of cancer and, you know, my father certainly was lung cancer. My mother's cancer, by the time we found it, um, wasn't lung cancer, but there was a spot on her lung, which was probably or possibly the primary cancer. Um, but, yeah, and people had breast cancer and, you know, stomach cancer and colon cancer. And, you know, they, they were well known, but people didn't talk about it. Cancer was one of those things that was almost like a sexually transmitted disease that, mm. you know, you, you didn't talk about, oh, I've got cancer. I'm going off to get it checked or whatever. Now everybody talks about it, and rightly so, yeah. because part of the, you know, the messaging around cancer is keep getting checked. You know, the early detection is the best way of, you know, yes, prevention in some cases, but there's plenty of cancers that you simply can't prevent. Um, yeah, nobody's worked out yet how to prevent breast cancer or prostate cancer, two of the biggest killers. Um, and so, you know, the messaging now is all around making it obvious when somebody's got it, they'll come on, you know, particularly celebrities, you know, hey, mm-hmm. I've got prostate cancer. Go, Men go out and get checked. You know, it's, so um, Was it a taboo, though? Didn't Why didn't they about talk about it? Or was I don't it just- know. I think it was, it was just fear as much as anything else. <laughs> Um, I don't think we understood as, you know, certainly as a child, I didn't, but, you know, as a teenager and as a young adult, when I was studying biology, I I mean, I certainly knew what cancer was, what caused it, how it got created and so on. Um, But I think the general population, it was almost like, just don't talk about it, go away. Mm. And, you know, sort of many people ended up dying of cancers that would have been treatable um, if they'd caught them earlier uh, because they just didn't want to talk about it. And it was fear, you know, that, you know, we all, you know, I had a friend who, you know, a school friend, you know, one of my closest friends died of leukemia in his teens. Um, and we all knew people who had had cancer and everybody thought, oh, cancer means you're going to lose your hair and everything. You didn't think that yeah, it was actually the therapy that was causing that. Mm. Um, and so, they, oh, I don't want that to happen, particularly as a kid. You know, oh, I don't want to lose my hair. I don't, I don't want to be sick all the time. Um, and so you just didn't talk about it. It's sort of weird. but uh, Well, that's it happens even today, right? I mean, mm. one of Kel's great aunts recently got diagnosed with breast cancer on both sides. Yeah. And it came out that she'd been aware of these issues, lumps. And I think one of them was like an open wound on her breast. And she just had it uh, for years yeah. and was like, yeah. nah, didn't want to talk about it. And you're like, no, what? No. 
Uh, oh, it's that fear of that. It's that fear of diagnosis yeah. is worse than the fear of dying, um, and and that's real uh, yeah. for many people. Is this the death sentence is worse than just dying? Um, well, and that's and that's one so, of those things, right? You kind of like if you're going to die, do you want to know exactly when and how, or do you want it to just be a surprise? And you're yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, over. exactly. I think uh, most people would probably opt for the second, you would imagine, where it's like- Yeah, yeah but whereas if there was a universal test, you know, I can go and get a blood test once a year and it'll tell me, am I going to get any cancer in the next 10 years? Yeah. Um, everybody would have it. Yeah. But the fact that there isn't, there are specific tests. We talked about, you know, prostate cancer before, you know, specific tests for prostate cancer. There are specific tests for- yeah, various forms of cancer, but there are as many forms of cancer that there is no test for um, yet, uh, or they're very expensive to do, and so they don't just become universal uh, things. It's, um, it's a weird one. It is but- strange, though, right? Like, I remember getting a COVID test a few times. I probably had three or four of them by now, but I yeah, remember the first time feeling like, if it comes back positive, I'm going to feel dirty. I'm going to feel like I've been, you know, diagnosed with HIV AIDS or something, you know, like yeah. it's this- or a sexually transmitted disease where you have this sudden like, because it's seen as such a negative thing in the, you know, cultural space mm. that it, it was funny waiting for that result to come back, even though it's something like COVID where it's very unlikely to ever kill me. It's still like, I don't like waiting and having to see if it comes back. Yes. And the same yeah. with any time I've had blood tests where they come back and tell you whether or not you've got HIV or any of these other sexually transmitted diseases, you're always like, oh, my God, they're, they're going to tell me I've got AIDS. They're going to tell me I've got yeah. AIDS. You know, you have yeah. all these, like, voices in your head saying, you know, the well, worst and, is going to come yeah, out. Yeah, you're right. And part of that part of that is just your you know, one's own personality and, um, you know, fears. But the second part is just the process. Mm-hmm. It's not like you go, you know, well, we'll just get... quickly have a, you know, if you go and have an X-ray or a, you know, an MRI or a CAT scan or something, you know within minutes yeah. if there is an issue, assuming that there is a you know, radiologist who can go and examine the scan and you know, talk to you about it. But when you're talking about blood tests and pathology having to deal with it, and then you, you know, when, you know, my blood test for the PSA, the prostate uh, agent, um, you go and have the blood test, you don't think about it, and then four or five days later you ring the doctor and the doctor's not there and the... Um, yeah, the receptionist just says, oh, yeah, the doctor wants to talk to you about this. Can we make oh, an appointment? You're like, oh, you, Jesus. You go, uh-oh. <laughs> you, know, you can't just tell me there's not a problem? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Um, and so then way? you wait another three or four days. Now, if it was urgent, you know, if you're going to drop dead tomorrow, they'll come at there. You know, they'll drag you in there. But there's this you know, thing of lying awake the night before going, am I going to get told that I've got prostate cancer? What's mm-hmm. going on here? And so there, there is an element of that fear. But. It's this, particularly in men, there's this thing of uh, we're invulnerable and, you know, we, you know, we're bulletproof. And so we don't need to go and get tested for various things. And, you know, which is why things like, you know, sorry for bouncing around, but um, if we live long enough as men, we're all going to die of prostate cancer. There is nothing more certain. You know, most of us die of something else before we get there, but it's just one of those things that... Um, yeah, you just need to, you know, once you get to your 50s and so on, you just need to keep getting checked. Just have your uh, prostate removed. <laughs> well, there is that. Well, yeah, you know, you know, plenty of yeah, plenty of people have that, particularly if there are um, genetic elements to them. People, mm-hmm. you know, how many women around the world have had breasts removed? Well, Angelina uh, Jolie did that, didn't she? Yeah, she had yeah because she it. came out and, you know, her mother, I think it was, died of breast cancer and she came out and went, um, yep, got ge- genetically tested. She was, she had the gene for, and not all breast cancer is genetic, but, no. um, and she had it. So she just had her breasts removed. I had it's a one of those who found that prophylactic things. She yeah. had BRCA1 gene, I think, and just found mm. out she had breast cancer and she's only 33. <clears throat> yeah. So had yeah. double mastectomy. Yeah. It's like, fuck, I just can't imagine what that, what poor, my poor friend was going through having to deal with no, that. Exactly. But she took it like a boss. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it is one of these interesting things where you're like, the good news is at least, you know, having both breasts removed isn't going to, it's not going to hinder your health, I don't think, right? Like, it's no, it's it's no. going to potentially impinge upon what you, what it is to be a woman. I'm sure there are there's massive a, yeah, issues there's there. There's a about- whole psychosocial thing that goes around with, you know, breasts being such a, well, firstly, you're never going to breastfeed a child. Yeah. You know, that, so there's that element. But then there's, yeah, breasts are such a, feminine, ob- objectively feminine thing that losing part of your femininity uh, must be, you know, 
I can't fathom it because there is no equivalent in men. You know, no, so. I've only met one one guy. I remember doing jujitsu and getting changed one time and being like, "Hey, mate, you know, where's your other nipple?" <laughs> like well, yeah. you've just got a line there. And I remember yeah. him being. I mean, I wasn't that blunt, but. Finding out that he'd had breast cancer himself. And oh had, yeah, there's removed, breast cancer is just, a thing in men as well. It's yeah. just nowhere near as prevalent because we don't have estrogen or nowhere near as much. No, as but do. we have the same tissue that it's formed in. Exactly. Yeah, I remember yeah. that, and he there was just no stigma attached to it. There's no, you know, he's just like, oh, yeah, it's got to cut out. Didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. A, yeah. Well, um, exactly. I was yeah. like, yeah, fuck, it, it is. So it is very different for men, obviously, than it is for women. But um, mm. yeah. Um, anything else to say? I guess on this topic. No, not really. Sort of, I think we're done. We, yeah. It's it's one of those ones where, yeah, it's, it's not the most pleasant subject to be talking about, but it's worth talking about because it's part of our society. Whenever you know, they um, having worked for a long time in you know, education and in you know, biological education in particular, um, you hear all the time in the press, oh, we're going to cure cancer. No, we're mm. not. We're never going to cure cancer because mm. we will never be able to prevent environmentally induced mutations in our DNA. We're going to be able to treat cancer extremely well, um, and every little step along the way does that. Um, and we will find treatments for cancers that are going to be preventative as well. We could, we might be able to prevent it, but we're not going to cure the underlying cause, which is our DNA is structurally unsound in its replication process, and things go wrong all the time, and some of those turn into cancer. So. Well, it's almost a a miracle that we grow into mm. fully functioning human beings that live as long as, say, my grandparents, who are, what, 91, 94? 91 and 89, yeah. Yeah, and you just like- well, Next week. You're like, you know, this person, this this human being, this biological organism has been on this earth, you know, close to 100 years now and yes. has been able to sustain itself with no catastrophic- Mm. Our cell repair mechanisms <laughs> are quite <laughs> incredible. And imagine yeah. how many trillion cells in that person's body are having to replicate yeah. perfectly every single or near perfectly every single yeah. time to Well, to the fact is that they don't them replicate down. perfectly, but we have such good repair mechanisms yeah. that our body gets rid of the duds yeah. most of the time. Yeah. So. Well, and that's the issue with cancer a lot of the time. When we speak about it, we use just a single term, but mm. there are so many different forms of it that are caused yes, by so exactly. many different things like UV radiation, viruses in the case, I think, of cervical cancer, which they, yeah. you know, created a vaccine the for. human papillomavirus. And yeah. so, the, the treatments and the preventions of a lot of them are so different that there is yes. no sort of blanket, this is what there we're going There is no do. blanket cure, yeah. It will be interesting to see what happens in the space of- I mean, what, what is currently science fiction, but you can imagine that in a few hundred years, if not thousands of years, assuming we're still here and, and um, not fighting with sticks and stones, that we will have nanites that we can use medically to do yes. certain things in the body. And, you you know, like, I can't fathom the kinds of treatments they're going to have, even for probably Noah and Noah's children, my son and mm. his children, that they didn't have for you and I, right? Like, I, I, I don't know how old the X-ray is, but it can't be that much older than my grandfather, right? Like, I mean- It's about maybe, that age. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you're like, before that, they had no way of inspecting your bones internally no. without opening you up, right? Exactly. And, and, and today, it seems like such a trivial thing. You're like, well, you can just get an X-ray. And like, <laughs> So, it, it always blows my mind to think about what are the kinds of things that will just be modern day- things that you just take for granted medically like oh, yeah. what, what's yeah. the name of the woman at the moment who's like i think she was the first um self-made billionaire in silicon valley and she's going to jail for fraud um, I don't know. Hold on. I, missed, I missed that story here we go i'll find it some of you guys will know it uh, her name's elizabeth holmes so it, it, it's a crazy story so this is from um theranus the company and she's getting done for huge fraud Effectively, I think she went to Stanford and she dropped out at 19 years old and created uh, this company, uh, Theranos, where the goal would be to take a single drop of blood from people mm. and be able to run hundreds of different tests on that thing, on yeah. that drop of blood. And the problem is that she, um, she was creating these machines to do it and it came out later that 
the results were falsified effectively. Uh, so great. it was impossible because yeah. they were diluting the blood drop down in order to run these tests on these different things for mm. real individuals in the real world and then giving them incorrect results for, oh, their, yeah, for their medical issues. So <laughs> she's the, the world's first self-made female billionaire, um, faces 20 years in jail for fraud. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is that it was a really interesting idea and you wonder what's going to be possible in the future. <clears throat> when we have machines that can, you can imagine that eventually we'll get to a point where we'll have the technology to be able to just take a single drop of blood or for you to wear something as trivial as, say, like a, a yeah. wedding ring that can sample your sweat or a little bit of blood or prick you or whatever on a daily basis mm -hmm. and get your metrics, you know. And, and so, I can't imagine, you know, I, I, I can imagine that's going to happen in Noah's lifetime. That there'll be some kind of, you know, insulin blood test thing that can test for a shitload of problems that are common day at the moment and they'll be dealt with. <laughs> so, but yeah, go and look into this thing. If you guys are interested in um in, in economics and fraud, lies, she seems like a total psychopath, this woman, Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> and they talk to her old teachers from Stanford and they're just like, yeah, she was off the planet. But yeah. she ended up mimicking... um. What's the guy's name? Steve Jobs from Apple. Right. She started wearing turtlenecks and she dropped her voice, made it really uh, low and speaking really? the same yeah. way. And everyone's just like, you are a Fruit Loop. So, <laughs> go suss it out. Suss it out. <laughs> anyway, that's probably enough for this episode, guys. Uh, we'll see you right. in the next one. <laughs> see Bye. Ya. Hopefully, I'm here next week. <laughs> All righty, you mob. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Goss. If you would like to watch the video, if you're currently listening to it and not watching it, you can do so on the Aussie English channel on YouTube. You'll be able to subscribe to that. Just search Aussie English on YouTube. And if you're watching this and not listening to it, you can check this episode out also on the Aussie English podcast, which you can find via my free Aussie English podcast application on both Android and iPhone. You can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone, Spotify, podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is. I'm your host, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a ripper of a day and I will see you next time. Peace.